Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of MIA podcast, where we answer the question, will Australian manufacturing ever return to the glory days of the 60s? And here to help us, uh, I think, really, really look at the you know export opportunities and opportunities within Asia as, itself as well, is uh, Jack Lee from Ford Business. So welcome, Jack. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me here. Excellent. Now, Jack, do you want to give uh, just a bit of background around your business and um, what you do and how you help manufacturing clients? Sure. Okay. I'll start with probably the, the shorter version first. So um, I was originally from uh, Malaysia. So I was the second generation Malaysian Chinese. Um, I finished my high school uh, in, in Malaysia. Then I completed my uh, degree in Monash Uni. Then after that, I went back to uh, Malaysia and Singapore, uh, working there for about seven years. Then eventually I came back uh, to Australia in 2004. And all the way up to 2012, I was in a corporate, uh, corporate um, working for a corporate. Then in 2012 uh, onward until now, um, I started uh, working into business brokering. So the company that I have now is Forward Business. Uh, we are a business brokering firm specializing in uh, helping uh, small businesses, especially manufacturing and wholesaler import export businesses in Australia to raise capital or exit. And uh, my, my niche area will be because of my background. So a lot of my uh, buyers and investors are coming from uh, uh, Southeast Asia and also China and India. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So, um, just to give like a little bit of background, were you involved in manufacturing much when you were living in that area, or was it more when you came to Australia you got involved in it? Yeah, so it's more it's more came to Australia and um, uh, probably a bit backwards. So, um, my sister, because I my hometown it's in Penang and uh, Malaysia. So there's a huge manufacturing plant there, high tech park, and so there are thousands or twenty thousands of uh, scale of manufacturing firm that were there. So my sister and my brother-in-law, they are both in manufacturing. So every time I go back there, you now we talk about orders opportunity uh, in Malaysia as well. Then when I come over here, um, so for the first probably about first five years when I'm in business brokering, I'm more focusing on the retail uh, perspective. So retail, brick and mortars, uh, type of businesses. Then up to a certain point, I realized that you know, there are certain um, good value manufacturing hasn't been realized. So uh, especially in Australia, it's known for you know, good quality, premium, and food safety. So over the years, they are, especially in the food and beverage or manufacturing industry. So there, over the years, there's some um, um, demand in uh, Malaysia and Southeast Asia that uh, about food safety and food quality. So therefore, then start uh, start looking into that in a bit more detail. Then subsequently, there are more opportunities that are coming through um, small smaller manufacturing firm, for example, um, turnover below ten million, or um, employee size uh, below hundred people. Start looking for uh, raising capital with someone looking to exit. So that's I start looking into that. So I would say that probably about five years ago, I start looking into that. Then eventually, of course, um, 2020, <laughs> yet, um, the, the pandemic hits and everyone knows what's happening to retail. So therefore, I pretty much uh, niche my area into solely into manufacturing, uh, helping manufacturing to raise capital, exit, um, and also import export uh, opportunity to into Asia or come from Asia. Fantastic, fantastic. Oh, that's that's good. Like, look, um, from from your insights, what differences would you see uh, in manufacturing in say Malaysia versus uh, Australia? Obviously, there's the scale. Um, yeah. What else are you seeing that's that's quite different? Yeah, I think um, simple ways that in, in manufacturing um, Malaysia, especially they are they're producing a lot of um, other, for example, like electronic goods and consumer goods. But whereas um, the manufacturing uh, in Australia that I'm dealing with, of course, the scale is one thing. So, um, and so second part would be something that is unique uh, to Australia. So that touched a couple of things. So um, probably um, this raw material in, is not in my area, so I wouldn't uh, go there. Um, but then so there are some other areas like uh, food and beverages. So some, Australia is a unique place that we have clean air, we have not a great water system and then we have you no know, good sunshine so produce a high grade quality product 
So, so for this thing, if I compare this to some of the things that just Australian can produce and no other country can can get it. So the simple thing is that now we have big export to uh, yeah, like hundreds of million of export to Singapore. We have wine to export to uh, Malaysia. Now we're getting like, hundreds of millions. And then of course we've got um, high demand from South Korea and Japan and China. This, these three countries sell the export, the import of Australian product. It's about, about 60 over percent of Australian export product going to these three countries. So they are generally interested in agricultural products and then so some of the food and beverages, of course, get some of the material products. So, so I think if I compare this thing, it's a demand and supply. So simple ways I go back to Malaysia, ask my mom, mom, what do you buy from Australia? So the simple thing is that it's just like, like oranges, apples, seafood, you know, those are the things and Australian wine, beers and some other products as well. So those are the, some differences, but where else you can't manufacture it now? This type of thing in uh, Vietnam or Japan or, or China or Malaysia. So, yeah. I think uh, I would say there's probably a lot of uh, the general population, at least, who would take a lot of that for granted. Uh, you know, for us, probably, you know, high quality, um, fresh seafood and fruit and veg uh, and meat. You know, we just go to the shop and we buy it. Like, it's just, it's always there. It's always been there. Um, mm -hmm. Give us a bit of a feel because uh, just prior to when we um, hit the record button, we were talking about that supply and demand for this in the Asian market. Um, what, what, how does, how do what, how does yes. what we supply differ to what they have locally? Yeah. So I think uh, come back to a very simple thing is that the premium, the quality and the food safety. So, so again, I touch us a lot on the food and beverages because that, that's the key area that um, I think um, um, Australia is different from a lot of Asian countries. So, for example, a simple one, of course, you can buy you know, apple and oranges and avocados and uh, from different countries, but Australian brand itself, it's, it means differently. So, when, when someone in uh, Asian grocery store pick up something, it's Australian made with the you know, kangaroo signs and things like that. So, that, that means differently. And, there's a premium price that people are willing to pay for. Of course, there's, there's a balance that need to, you know, need to cater for, for some demographic, they probably wouldn't be able to afford that. Okay, that's fine, they still have a different market to buy from, but then there are the markets that has been, uh, is growing. So the middle class in Asia is growing. So they are looking for opportunity to get more product from from, a, from Australia and a great product. So. Then on the other side, so um, because of this, I'll come back to my area. So because of this, then there are more um, uh, uh, investors or, or business people that are looking to come into Australia and invest into um, a company like, uh, like this. So some of the company, the like manufacturing company, they, they may not be you know, turning over 10 or hundreds millions, but then somewhere, somewhere between 10 million and below. That should be just nice size for uh, a potential a joint venture partnership and uh, raising capital from the uh, investor from Asia. And again, niche into a bit more area. Um, this is this is some one of the areas that I've been working for the last five years, um, which are the uh, Australian initiative for immigration uh, program. It's called Business Innovation Investment uh, Program. And that's like, in short term, it's like you probably heard of like subclass 188A, so that's business visa. So people are willing to invest into you know, to Australian uh, manufacturing, and the typical amount would be 500000 to $1.5 million. And then the whole equity, they have skin in the game. And then that become a joint venture partnership with uh, uh, Asian business people. Then they can potentially bring the product into the channel that they already set up there. So, yeah. And would you say at the moment there's more demand than supply, or the other way around? Yes. Yeah, so, so it's um, so three years ago. So we, we got this um, hit by pandemic. So uh, two and a half years gone. So probably we can see, especially in the in the CBD, let's just in Sydney. So you could walk down uh, some of the shops and uh, a lot of streets. Uh, many of the retail uh, shops hasn't been fully recovered yet. So, so in terms of investment opportunity for this particular category, like VIP program uh, investor, so 
every year there's about 3,900 uh, approval. So that means that there'll be 3,900 investors looking for investment opportunity. So considering the retail is not recovering very well for some area, and then, and then plus also the, the, the risks and, and, and also the uncertainty that people are still worried about this. So therefore that create an, a great opportunity for um, manufacturing, wholesale, import, export, and then someone a great company. So we're not talking about this uh, humongous large size, like hundreds of million turnover company. We're talking about somewhere between you know, two to five million turnover or up to 10 million turnover. So this would be a right size that if um, for the investor perspective, they're looking at this, now there will be opportunity to contribute capital, resource, skill set, and connection, business connection in their country. So therefore, to answer John's question, will be like, I see that that's huge, great opportunity for manufacturing business, and and that's that's a demand to sell. It's um, it not it's it's not enough supply, basically. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Now, what are you saying those companies do with that that investment once it once that once it hits the yeah. so the manufacturing so manufacturing companies? What are they doing with that investment once it comes in? Yeah, I, I give you a, a few examples. So one of the company that um, I'm, I'm working with, uh, they produce uh, probiotic drinks. So at the moment, they're selling to Woody's, Coles, not Harris Farm. So those are the uh, supply. Uh, those are the uh, bigger chain. But at the same time, so they do have some small volume selling uh, to uh, to Singapore. But then at the same time, so as because the the demand getting increased and then they need capital, and they're turning over about. $3.5 million. So $3.5 million manufacturing, when you when they try to raise capital from the banks or some other you know, financier, they find it a bit challenging. And at the same time, so from the risk perspective, so they were looking for potentially looking for equity partner. So some investment coming in, someone that had know-how and uh, helped them to, to grow their market. So, so for that perspective, so I'm having them to raise capital between 500000 to $1 million, but not just purely raising debt capital, more like raising equity par partner. So someone that can put money in there and then put some skill set and put some effort and, and work together to grow the company. So, and then with that, that funding that coming through, so this company is looking to uh, move the factory into a larger area. And then with that the larger area, then they'll be able to automate certain products, certain, uh, certain line. For example, the capping at the moment is still, still a manual one, so they'll, they'll do a capping, laboring. So, so those are the money that they can use to to either move the uh, move the plant. Some of them will develop a new product. Some of them will, will go into more into R and D. So, these are the funding that can be used. So, for for size like no two million, five million turnover, five hundred thousand to a million dollar investment, that that will be a great great help for for the agro. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's interesting to know. Um, I think there's the, you know, probably the 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 general assumption. I would say from the general public, at least, is that um, you know manufacturing um, is is doing it tough. I think I think traditionally Australians have always looked at that and just uh, I, I think it assumed that trying to tap into those markets is relatively tough. Um, but from what I'm hearing, it sounds like there's a fair bit of demand um from those countries and there's a, there's a lot of opportunity on the plate that, that's right yeah because uh, but i did uh, have a, a look up on the statistics so about forty nine thousand manufacturing so my statistic could be a bit outdated but for 49 uh, thousand manufacturing uh, company in in australia and now there's about 98 percent so about what forty seven thousand uh small manufacturing firm so that would be like they will be like less than 20 employees or less than a $10 million turnover. So those are the manufacturing firm that you know, it's it's hard for them to, to grow. For example, let's say you take a $2 million and then they set aside you know, 3% of, um, of a marketing budget. So the 60,000, whether they can do that for export or whether they can do that for growing a new businesses or a new, uh, new products. So there's a limited uh, funding for them. So what I'm trying to do is that from the business brokering perspective, so we help them to find the right partner, raising capital, become an equity partner, they have skin in the game, and then grow, in, grow the market domestically, and at the same time, sort of create opportunity to, so to, to overseas. Mm. Now, 
Um, now, you mentioned some of the the stronger export countries. Um, do you mind just going through those again? From what I heard there was there was South Korea, um, yeah. Japan, um, and you China. also mentioned uh, obviously China. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what's some of the other countries as well? You mentioned Singapore, Malaysia. What's some of our stronger export partners at the moment? I think that the strongest one uh, probably with China, but I think thirty eight percent, and best, um, and J Japan and South Korea add up with twenty something. So these three countries are sixty percent. So Southeast Asia, Singapore, and and um, Malaysia, because I'm close to home, so I just look it up to see. But of course, I know other country like Indonesia, and just a different country had different uh, demand. So mm. um, for uh, just just briefly, just look it up. So if you if you look at China, Japan, and Korea probably more looking to, into agriculture products, seafood product, and then for other country, we're looking at so raw materials and this and that as well. So yeah, so just I think Australia has so much to offer. Just had some Australia it's just a bit um, probably a bit shy away from not telling people that no, we are great, so we can we can produce a lot of things. But at the same time, I saw the opportunity. If you're not doing that, then the other country that just just grab it, grab and go. So. And we are just yeah. touching the beverage. We are talking not talking about the advanced technology. So Australia is, is good at creativity, and then we have no um, modern manufacturing initiative, and we have a lot of um, run and initiative produced by uh, offered by government to to help this, including the export grant and all sort of opportunity that you, you should be grabbing it. Sounds like a perfect storm for success. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, um, you know, looking at uh, something you just mentioned is that I think traditionally we we do shy away from yeah. shouting about shouting out to the world how good we are. Uh, I've been saying on this podcast for a long time, you know, Americans traditionally, you know, they're, they're good at beating their chest. Um, they're probably they're a lot more overt. Um, mm. But it, it, it is nice to know that there is there's definitely opportunities out there. Um, it seems like our our opportunities are creating the de the demand. Uh, but it'd be good for us to have a a, a central voice which goes out um, mm. on behalf of manufacturing just to you know just to remind the world of of how good we are, how how good our quality is, how good our our initiative, our creativity, our ingenuity, you know, all, all that. Um, be great to remind the world, you know. That's how good we are. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's um, that say it all. Like whether it's manufacturing or just just um, Australian image by itself. So so when we talk about Australian, it's like not very authentic, down to earth, and sometimes could be a bit laid back. But it's <laughs> great personality and you know, premium products and high qualities. And we are not over saying we are not over deliver. No, we are just 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 nice. So I think just just other images say if you can just continue working on that. And then focusing on certain areas and certain products, and don't shy away. Grab the opportunity. You know, go to trade shows and you know, grab uh, work with uh, Australia and you know, these other companies that these other initiatives that we can work with. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Um, now, let's flip from into the mm. conversation around um, exit strategies. So, um, yeah. I think there's there's a lot of a lot of business owners we we speak to who uh, po probably in the back of their mind they've got a rough idea of what they want to do with, with their business. Mm -hmm. um, what what are you seeing manufacturers do um, as part of their their exit strategy? Yeah. In fact, in fact, funny thing is that the, the exit strategy and raising capital, the there are a huge lot of similarity there. So basically, when you when you want to do something, you want to raise capital or you want to sell the company. So there are certain things that you need to show it to your investor or the, the future purchaser or your successor. So, so one of the basic things is that now there are list of things. So there's um, exit strategy, um, exit strategy expert that can help you out. So business coach and and accountants and they, they can do their part. But from the business brokering perspective, so typical one, you look at um, a few things and one of the few things that not all starting from your numbers. So your so your accounting, your books and now what with your accountant. Some typically if you're looking to exit or looking to raise capital, it might take some time. It might take you not know, six months or one year. To get yourself ready for that, so the numbers have to be you now all tidy up and make sense, and 
keep it up to date. So the ATOs and everything. And then, so that's from the financial side. And then the second part, the operation part is equally or more important than this. So one of the things I love is that automation. So if, if let's say this company has all sort of system in place. So for example, let's say you have a good CRM system. So I'll speak to John, so get a good CRM system. You have good reporting to so everyone in and out. So all, all the expenses, no, the growth, everything is spot on. You can see that that you will make my job so wonderful, so easy to do. And then if you have an ERP system, no tracking from your input to output, so everything's there. And then and then plus all the accounting system, all the, all those things that systemize they put it in place, that will make uh, the access strategy much easier. Then on top of that, so then the, the last part we need to touch about is about the, the business operator. So basically the business owner. So I always say that now, if you want to re retire or you want to exit, make yourself redundant a few a few, a few few years earlier. So what it means is that if you love, love to play, play golf, so if you started with play one day a week, eventually two days a week, three days a week. So slowly step away from the day-to-day -day operation. So if you have a good system, good financials, and then you replace yourself with a, a great process or a management team, then that will be the time that you, know, that's, you can walk away easily. And without this, what it means? It means that you will take a cut on your on the sales price. So with mm -hmm. this, you make it easier for sale and then make make a sales price much higher. Yeah. 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 What do you what are you seeing uh, happen, happen with business owners these days? I mean, are they resistant to handing over? Are they sort of like, are they exhausted and just like happy to have that earn out? Where, where are they sitting? Yeah, I think it's uh, half and half. So as much as some, you know, they, they, they know that it's time for them to step away. But then at the same time, so no, their sentiment. So they are the business that they have been building and working for the last 30, 40, 50 years. And so they're probably looking around to see you know, their next generation, whether anyone will pick up and more than likely not. And so they're looking for opportunity as well. But at the same time, so not just that, not just themselves, it's about the company, about the culture, about the employees, mm -hmm. about the customers and the suppliers. So they want to make sure that they have the right successors to take over. So, and then that's, um, so sometimes now when a new new buyers coming in and uh, the new investor are coming through so they got to be worried about whether this you no know, this new person can can take the responsibility can you know, can continue on the legacy so that that's one of the things that they need to access so it's no yes or one one or two way to do that there are multiple ways that you now we can assess the case by case basis so for example one of the ways that Instead of no, just it, it might take a longer transition period. So the the current owner might take no six months or one year or two or three slowly step away, and then could be work out a earn out type of approach. So and then it could be working working out some kind of arrangement that now they are the current owner still supporting them as a consultation basis and this and that. So yeah, so that's that's uh, to answer a question. There's some there's not one way to do that. Depend on um, the incoming. Uh, the, buyer investor and then sort of exiting uh, current owners. Yeah. Yep. And uh, after that, uh, after that, um, I guess the M&A process, mm -hmm. are you seeing uh, a good solid transition? Um, you know, I, you hear some horror stories where, you know, essentially investors come in, they're there just for profit, you know, they, they essentially pillage a company and then exit. Um, what are you seeing happening in the marketplace? Because I think that's one of the biggest challenges for a business yeah. owner is like, is getting the right people in to know that they sure. can hand over successfully. Yeah, I, I see. Typically, when you no know, the the big changes typically happening to the larger company, like you no know, large size company, talking about hundreds of you know, billions of turnover. So, but smaller company like you no know, five ten million dollar turnover and below. So typically, the the income um, a business owner will be the operator themselves. So what it means is that they will come in, they will take over certain roles, and they will work in a business. And by coming into the factories and uh, work with the staff, and eventually they will build the relationship and the connection there as well. So I I see lesser huge changes like you no know, overnight thing changes, fire this and that. Lesser that lesser happening in the smaller company that I deal with. So typically they will come in, get to know the staff, and they actually as worries as 
um, the same way as well, they worry the staff will be leaving them because they need them as well. So at the same time, so they come in, they try to learn as much and then they try to take on whatever things that the previous owner had taken on. So they are a huge challenge. So typically they won't, some will, but then typically well, the way I see that 90% of them, that they will continue running as, as usual for the you know, next six months or one year. And then, then they'll start progressively implement some, some changes. Of course, some of them, they will put in some new idea too fast, too soon. But again, now over the time, they try to keep the business running and keep all the all the things that as usual. Then, so that lesser impact to the client and also to the to the supplier as well. Yeah, yeah, no, fair call. Because I mean, it's obviously in their best interest as well. Mm. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, like you mentioned, is um, keeping that fine balance of keeping your your staff on board because um, they're generally what you know what I've seen in manufacturing is that. Uh, a, an employee who is attached to a manufacturing company, typically they're quite loyal and mm. um, they have a, a extensive knowledge and just going in there and you know, making yeah. huge changes, you'll, you'll generally lose <laughs> your, your, your workforce, you know, your knowledge base pretty quickly if, if you do that too, too quickly. So, um, yeah, it's good to hear that yeah. people want to it's do it right. That, that's also a good point as well. So the, the... When we talk about the the VIP, the business visa uh, program, so some of the some of the investor or some of the migrant, the new migrant to the country, so they are they have uh, less understanding of the culture, the way you know Australian run businesses and all those things. So this gives them an opportunity to first invest as a minority shareholder first. For example, let's say they put in a half a million dollar or to me a million one point five million dollar. To get hold of 35 percent not 40 percent of the shares for example just just a number there so they become a shareholders become directors so they will work as a as a partnership background as well so the current owner will be still you know, starting the ships and everything so they will be running this so eventually and this program will last for at least three to five years so eventually three to five years and they can gradually learn and uh, from there then they can gain more experience and eventually can slowly take over if let's say that's the uh, the business owner willing to do so 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 that's quite a kind of good slow transitions and growing business together eventually you know when the time is right then the business owner can exit yeah oh it's good to hear that's good um now i guess from the uh a broader question um where would you see Australian manufacturing in general? Because I think you've got a really unique position at the moment where you are seeing it from the demand side. Yeah. Um, where would you say is the future of, of manufacturing at the moment? We've had, uh, sorry, just before you do answer. So like what a bit of context is, we always, I always ask quite these questions is, uh, we've had uh, the Modern Manufacturing Initiative. There's a lot going on in manufacturing right now. We've had uh, a very, very different, um, international markets, say to three years ago prior to COVID, um, where you know supply chain, all those those issues as well, um, transport costs, logistics, all those layers. So it's sort of like I think the last couple of years have been more favourable for Australian manufacturing. Um, I always ask this question of like, is it is it a honeymoon period or is there genuinely a good future for manufacturing? What what's your take yeah. on that? I think that there's huge opportunity for Australian manufacturing, whether it's just supplied domestic or, or internationally. So let's just come back to it again. So you know, great product, quality, safe, and, and also eventually, like I said, all the supply chain disruption, all the skill shortages and uh, the cost higher overseas and all, the, all those things add together. So I think that create itself, there's a huge opportunity that uh, manufacturing in Australia can grow bigger and faster. So at the same time, so that's again that when we create that, that create another uh, demand from overseas. So what it means that, so let's say we grow advanced um, or modern uh, manufacturing. So there will be material that uh, potentially required from uh, from overseas. So that's also create another opportunity. So probably the, the reason I'm saying that is uh, just recently as well, I I work with uh, one of the manufacturing company. So what it means that there's a, a Asian uh, uh, Chinese investor through the business uh, innovation investment program, they invest in, uh, to a, a, a clothing company. So the initial thought was um, after they invest them, 
they want to grow this market and uh, bring the clothing um, uh, fashion style to Asia. But I, after a few years and they work it through, then a lot of few, a few months they work it through, they realize that actually that opportunity could be a bit um, uh, later. But then the immediate one is that this um, this Chinese gentleman will be able to source the, the material from a uh, cheaper and better material from, from China. So what it means that because of this, not necessarily they're creating market to Asia, but then they have the opportunity to source cheaper and better uh, material from, from overseas as well. So to answer a question, so if let's say Australian manufacturing is growing, and I see that there's huge potential there, and there's opportunity not only to export market, but tap into this, and then there'll be an opportunity to grab all of uh, cheaper material and better material as well. Interesting, interesting. So, um, like, or in, or in general, it looks like there's a there's a there's a positive future there. Um, and um, I just wanted to, uh, we'll put these in the show notes as well. Um, just mention some of the resources that manufacturers can tap into as well. Obviously, there's there's Austrade. Um, some of, what's some of the other ones that you're aware of? Just to get those conversations yeah. going. I think some of the grant, so the, the EMDG grant, I think that's one of them. So if you have any export opportunity, I think there's also a lot of uh, R&D as well, research and development. So they are experts at doing so. So I have a couple of companies that are uh, manufacturing company that uh, when we talk, think about R&D, sometimes people think about it has to be you not know, develop something unique and something special. But I'm, in fact, it's uh, not necessary. That's because the process itself of you know, research and development, that's already defined by it can be half funded by the government. So I think that that area as well. And then plus also, um, we are people. So we, if we need to do something, I think it's all come back to business network. So we need to tap into business network. So if you're looking to do something with India, so potentially you can tap into like Indian uh, business council in Australia. So if you're looking to do something with Southeast Asia, they are in you know, Asia, Singapore, there's you know, China, Taiwan. And so there are different type of um, association that it can tap into. So that that's probably that one, a few things that uh, uh, we can tap into that. Yeah. Okay, good. We'll put those in the show notes as well. Um, something else we'll put in the show notes is um, how people can contact you. So before we talk about that, what, what types of, of manufacturing uh, businesses would you love to speak to and how do they get in contact with you? Okay, so um, I would say probably not specifically from the industry or, or particular type, so probably from the size. So if the size is more than $10 million uh, turnover, or that probably not, not my category. So manufacturing that below $10 million turnover have uh, less than um, uh, say 100 employees. So, and then it could be food and beverages. So anything that producing a unique um, a food beverages product uh, in Australia, Fantastic. And then something to tap into um, for the last few years as so I did rubber manufacturing, window manufacturing, you know, aluminium. So these are the raw material manufacturing. So that so that's something that I'm more than happy and I got experience to, to work with that. So it could be in the form of raising capital, it could be a form of uh, exiting, not necessarily now, it could be three years or five years down the road. So we just need to plan out the path. So yeah, so this just will be something that I'm passionate about. Then. And mm. hopefully I can help them to grow for a few years before they can capitalize on the growth. Yeah, um, and that's, I think that's one of the things I've always, way mm. back when I first started business, one of the first um, uh, presentations I saw was that whole thing of like, um, think about your exit strategy and plan as, as early as you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Even if it's just like getting a little bit of advice up front just to get the yeah. wheels in motion, uh, yeah. but do that as early as you can. Absolutely, John. Number one thing is that automate as much as you can. So automate through system, through process. So not make yourself redundant. So yeah. So anyway, so that those are things I'm happy to to work with and to to put a path together and get the right people to help out. Yeah, great. Um, now, uh, which uh, we're, we're sort of towards the end of the the podcast yes. recording, but um, is there any advice you would give to Australian manufacturers right now? I think definitely so um, don't be shy away to you know, to to tap into get some help and um, now they are again just just Asia just a few hours away 
And when we talk about Asia, it's a like half a population of the world. And and so if you look into just look internally, you, know, you walk on the street in Sydney, you, you see half of the people walking around will be Asian as well. So tap into that that area and and grow the market and export and not like, internally and externally. So so I think that's a huge opportunity and uh, keep keep doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And like for me, for me, I've I've uh, I spent a fair bit of time in Korea and Japan um, awesome. many years yeah. ago, and like those countries are dear to my heart. I haven't been to um, that many other other parts of um, of Asia yet, but like for me, just to visit them, it's f- their, their fun fun culture, um, their you know that they're, they're they're quite unique, and they're uh, I think just a joy to be around. Um, so, like you said, you know, if, even if you just go over there for for a trip, just to just to get a bit of a feel for the some of the countries and the different types of cultures out there, um, they're very diverse and um, you know a lot of fun, a lot of good food, a lot of good people, good times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah now that we can travel, so yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So look. Um, so as a I, we've I think we've answered most of it, but as sort of a, a final final wrap up question, do yep. you feel Australian manufacturing will ever return to the glory days of the sixties? It's hard for me to actually explain that because <laughs> the 60s, I'm not sure what what happened in sixty, but I, I see that there's definitely there's certain sector of manufacturing um, definitely is growing uh, fast, and um, there are certain for example some of the areas that we may not be able to go back there. But in some of the areas that we are doing better, better than before. So, so I think that's the huge opportunity. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good to hear. Good to hear. Like, uh, and I've 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 enjoyed this because I think, like I said before, we're hearing it from more the demand side, which is a bit of a unique yeah. unique angle. Um, so before we wrap up, um, how do people get in contact with oh, you? Yes, um, yes. You just want to shout out your your um, your website and any other yes, contact yes. details you can give away as well. Yeah, easy. So, um, so my name is Jack. So Jack at forwardbusiness.com.au is my uh, email address. So Forward Business uh, is my company. So yeah, so looking forward to so any any anything. Happy to always jump on the call in person. So have a coffee anytime. And Jack's good fight. He's got a good sense of humor. So, uh, pleasure to be around. Uh, so thank you again, Jack, for, for coming on. Um, yeah. It's uh, For me, it's been quite interesting to hear um, your perspective of, of manufacturing, which is great. Um, and just that, you know, I, I'm, I'm loving this conversation of um, there's definitely aspects of manufacturing that have a good, so, good solid op, uh, opportunity for, for a lot of growth. So thanks again for coming on board. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed the, the, this, this hours here. Pleasure, pleasure. <laughs> and uh, to our regular listeners, thank you for listening, watching, however you consume the podcast. Um, we will see you in our next podcast. And thank you again, Jack. All right. Thank you, John. And thank you all. Okay. See you soon.